So um, welcome to what might be you know the last maybe three like three weeks of the class. So today we are going to talk about <clears throat> um, we're going to start a new topic today. Uh, but uh, just a few reminders before we get started. Uh, this homework six that's on Canvas. Uh, please uh, do um, get started on it. This one's a slightly uh, different homework in that uh, it uh, you get a little more time because I didn't want to have a deadline during Thanksgiving. Uh, but that means that it, this one's going to take you all the way to the end of the semester. Uh, it's due on uh, December third. Um, and that's the last the, the day of the last lecture for the semester. And uh, it involves implementing support vector machines, uh, deriving logistic regression, and implementing logistic regression. Uh, when I say deriving logistic regression, I mean uh, deriving the uh, stochastic gradient descent for uh, logistic regression. Um, so you'll have to uh, you know compute the grade. You, know, you have to on paper work out the gradient of the loss and uh, uh, your uh, implementation will mirror your uh, derivation. And then there's an extra credit question that involves neural networks. We'll be talking about neural networks today. Um, a quick reminder about what all is left uh, in the semester for, so that you can kind of allocate time for it. Uh, this homework six, of course, that's due on December 3rd. And then there is also uh, uh, this, uh, the, the the final project, there is one more submission that's left, namely uh, your, your, you could call it the third milestone or the final report. It involves uh, submitting three more runs to um, Kaggle and also uh, uh, submitting a final report on Canvas. The final report would be a little bit more substantial uh, than your uh, milestones. So uh, it'll, you know, it'll talk about, you know, try to summarize information from the entire semester. I'll be talking about that as we go along. And then there's also a final exam. Uh, this is officially scheduled for December 8th, but um, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's not, a, uh, it, since nothing is synchronized, uh, the exam will be uh, on Canvas. It will be essentially a timed quiz on Canvas. Uh, you get two hours. Uh, it, it will not, I, I'm, I don't want to have it on December 8th at uh, 8 a.m. because that's just cruel. Um, I mean, the 8 a.m. part. So uh, uh, it'll probably be a window that's open for maybe a few days and you get to pick your favorite two hours during that and finish it in one shot. Are there any questions about the homework, the project, or the exam? Uh, there's one, uh, can I post the LaTeX submissions for homework uh, six, I think? Yes. Uh, um, oh yeah, uh, so the, it'll, I'll, I saw the message on, uh, um, on the discussion board, uh, we'll get it done before today. Um, there will not be an optional homework seven. Originally, there was a plan for an optional homework seven, but uh, that uh, since this one's taking us to the end of the semester, I don't want to give a homework after the semester is over because that's uh, I don't think that's great. So uh, there won't be an optional homework seven. That's why there are. All, I mean. Uh, you know, you can think of uh, all the, that's why the extra credit question here is a little, has more points than usual. Are there other questions? Um, for the final exam, um, so in, let's just say that it's a two hour exam and I'm not going to enforce that it is a closed book because I don't think it's possible to do that uh, when it's remote. So uh, it's going to be open book, open notes, anything. Uh, it will be a quiz on Canvas. Um, it will look very much like uh, your uh, uh, homework, uh, the, the, the quizzes, the quiz homework that you did on uh, uh, Canvas, except you get, it's timed and you get one shot at it. And it might be a little bit, uh, I mean, it, uh, um, it, it will not involve, um, you know, uh, just working through something, or maybe it was, I don't. I haven't made the final exam yet, so. Uh, but yeah, I, I can't uh, um, prohibit you from opening a book if you are at home. Um, so uh, you, so we will. Uh, I, I'll give you details about the questions about the exam and stuff like that. Um, so what will happen is uh, most likely I will be. Um, uh, available on uh, email through for a certain times during the exam period. 
uh, and uh, the, and I'll ask my TAs also to make themselves available. Of course, they have their own exams and all that. And uh, you can ask questions during that time. So if you really want to kind of uh, make sure that uh, you get, you, you want to take advantage of that, then you, you should uh, uh, make sure that you do the exam during that period. Um, the one other thing is uh, during the exam, if you want to ask questions, I will also, in case you want to do the exam during, uh, uh, you know, when we are not available, then we will uh, leave a text box towards the end of the exam where you can type in any assumptions that you've made to answer a question. And uh, if the assumptions are reasonable and uh, uh, if they are valid, uh, we will uh, take that into account. Um, it's going to be mostly multiple choice or fill in the answer, but uh, I am expecting that there'll be some typed answers also. Um, it's going to be, uh, so regarding the Zoom session, it will be a little tedious because I'm planning the exam day to be, uh, the exam period, the, the Canvas thing to be open for at least a day, uh, during which you can take the exam um, whenever you want. So having a day long Zoom session is, is going to be a little tricky. Um, I would rather prefer something by email. I, I'll, but this is a good suggestion and uh, I'll discuss this with my TAs and get back on this. Um, so there's, uh, it feels like there's a lot of ambiguity in the questions on the homework so far. Um, we'll try to make the exam questions less ambiguous. The homework questions are designed to be uh, more, uh, you know, where you think it through and it's designed to help you get through the material. The exam questions are not going to be like that. So, uh, so there's a question about the homework. Uh, let me just pull it up so that I can. In question three, there's a bit of an inconsistency. Uh, does the first layer take either zero or one, but the second layer takes a real value? Yeah, nothing prevents it. Zero and one are also real values. Uh, so yeah, uh, you're right. Uh, we'll talk about this in a minute now when we talk about neural networks, but uh, there's not, these are arbitrary choices that we can make. And uh, if you think about the, the, the big trick that we are pulling with uh, things like perceptron and SVM with Boolean functions is we're treating true and false as real numbers. We're treating zero and one or minus one and one as real numbers. Um, it's totally fine. Um, um, so uh, I, I'm assuming that you're, uh, the, the, the question that you're asking is about uh, the sigmoid activation. Um, it's totally fine, and uh, there's nothing uh, uh, there's nothing to, that prevents that from working out. It's uh, just a, a simple translation of the zero one scale to the minus one one. Think about how to make it work, and uh, it should just uh, be fine. You don't need to do the translation because the neural network should take care of it. Um, are there any other questions? Um, and, and regarding the exam, there'll be more details forthcoming in the coming uh, weeks. So we're still kind of trying to figure out what's the best way to uh, uh, get the Canvas exam going without causing too much grief in terms of logistics. Uh, so uh, uh, I will, uh, I mean, all your suggestions are very useful. So we'll try to uh, incorporate them also. Um, any other questions about homeworks, projects, exams? All right, uh, if there aren't any, uh, today we're going to start a new topic. Uh, we'll talk about, we're going to talk about neural networks today. Um, so the plan is, uh, this is going to be uh, occupying us. Oh, there's a, how many questions should we expect? Um, this is uh, still up in the air. Um, for this, I'm assuming this is for the final exam. It's still up in the air, partly because uh, having never done uh, an online exam uh, of this kind, I'm still kind of calibrating things. So uh, uh, I, I don't know the answer to that yet. All I can say is it will be a reasonable number. Uh, this, is, this is the kind of stuff that my TAs and I have to uh, flesh out and we'll, you'll have more details. All right, so uh, let's talk about neural networks. So uh, the plan for today and uh, going ahead is first we'll talk about what neural networks are and uh, where, uh, you know, how, how do you make 
predictions using a neural network. And then finally, how you can train with them. Uh, these are just the technical things. But then when it comes to neural networks, there are a lot of uh, practical issues that we have to deal with. And uh, it's a pretty large set of things. So uh, this will occupy us for a while. And uh, it's going to, the, the practical concerns introduces a bunch of new, uh, new ideas that uh, we'll encounter. But before we jump into neural networks, let's just take stock of where we are. We've seen different learning algorithms through the semester. We've seen decision trees, perceptron, adaboost, uh, support vector machines, logistic regression, and more generally also uh, ensembles and such things. And in terms of general machine learning ideas, we've looked at overfitting. Uh, we've looked at machine uh, mistake bound learning. We've looked at pack learning and sample complexity. And this analysis led us to this uh, use of VC dimension as a way of choosing hypotheses. And uh, the key intuition uh, from VC dimension was uh, pick hypotheses that are uh, uh, parsimonious, that are smaller. Um, and uh, we also looked at this difference between training errors and generalization error. The training error is the empirical error on the training set. The generalization error is uh, the, the true error, the, the error that we really care about. Uh, the training error is something we can measure. The generalization error is something we hope to minimize. And uh, trying to minimize this, uh, the generalization error uh, gives us this notion of regularized risk minimization or regularized empirical loss minimization, where you have a loss term that you want to optimize on the training data, but taking that to zero would be problematic because you, you could overfit. And in, you add a term that is called a regularizer to the objective, and this term um, balances out um, the overfitting and uh, uh, generalization. Most recently, we looked at uh, uh, the third uh, uh, way to answer this question, or the, another way to answer this question of how, what does it mean to learn? And this involved Bayesian learning, where we uh, uh, looked at these criteria for learning, namely uh, maximum a posteriori and maximum likelihood uh, estimation. And uh, both of these criteria can be uh, for many different kinds of models. Most of these criteria can be, uh, both these criteria can be written uh, as an analogous problem to empirical loss minimization. So uh, all of these things kind of sort of uh, feel similar because one way or another, we end up writing down an objective function and we have to minimize it. Um, Bayesian learning, under the umbrella of Bayesian learning, we looked at uh, a couple of different specific learners. We looked at uh, the Bayesian interpretation for uh, um, for uh, the least mean square regression. And we looked at logistic regression, which was trained using the maximum uh, a posteriori um, uh, criteria. And actually, we also saw maximum likelihood estimation for Bayesian, uh, for logistic regression. Uh, I wouldn't go as far as saying vision learning is logistic regression. Instead, I would say logistic regression models, the, uh, we saw logistic regression models uh, being trained using a Bayesian criterion, namely uh, both uh, in your homework, you're looking at maximum a posteriori learning. Uh, Bayesian learning is much more than that. I mean, you can, for any kind of a, classifier or a, any kind of a prediction problem, you can set up a Bayesian criterion for uh, the learning problem um, for how to uh, find the best classifier. And this is, uh, and you can kind of work out the whole process and you will get a Bayesian uh, learner for that particular model. The important thing is, uh, one thing that we were uh, um, kind of uh, not entirely um, clear about is, uh, the following. Notice that perceptron, support vector machine, and logistic regression are very clearly linear classifiers. Adaboost is actually also a linear classifier if your weak learners are just features because your final classifier is simply um, a linear combination of the features and you take a threshold. So essentially, these all of these things produce linear classifiers. And one thing that uh, we didn't really, really resolve was uh, what if I want, what if the decision boundary is not linear? One answer for that is maybe you can expand the feature space uh, using feature transformations or such things like that. Or you can invent new features so that you're uh, in the, uh, uh, the invent in the new space, in the new representation, 
you don't have a nonlinear classifier. But that's an unsatisfying answer. Uh, both of those are unsatisfying because on one hand, how do you know what features to invent? And this is a question that uh, several of you have asked uh, both in class and office hours in the past. How do you know which transformations to consider? Another uh, perhaps more important question to think about is where do these features come from? Think about your project. Uh, I give you three feature sets and I also give you this miscellaneous uh, uh, features and say play with it. But where did those three features come from? And what features do you invent from the miscellaneous set? It's entirely um, a subjective choice. It's a design choice. So it's not really satisfactorily resolved. And the reason for that is at some level, you need to bring in an understanding of the problem. Um, given these two questions, neural networks are uh, particularly interesting because all of these uh, general principles still apply to neural networks, but they attempt to answer both these questions. Where do the features come from? And what if we want to train nonlinear classifiers? These are not the neural networks are not the only way to answer this question, but uh, given uh, recent, uh, uh, you know, re uh, recent findings in research uh, and also in production, they seem to be incredibly good at uh, doing this. So let's spend some time thinking about them. Um, so we'll be, as I said, we'll be looking at what neural networks are. We look at uh, it's a class of it's a, it's a it's a way to represent a hypothesis class. Um, and anytime you see a new hypothesis class, two questions should come up. Um, actually three, what do they express? Uh, how do you make a prediction with it? And how do you train with it? Um, so when we look at what's a neural network, we'll also look at what kinds of functions they characterize. And then we look at uh, prediction first, and hopefully uh, that will, we'll, I, I'm, I'm thinking that will be where we'll have to stop today. And uh, we'll talk about training on Thursday. So let's get started. Um, we'll look at uh, what's the hypothesis class of neural networks and what their expressiveness is. So we've seen linear classifiers. Here's a cartoon example of a linear classifier or a linear threshold unit. We have four features, x1, x2, x3, and x4. And uh, we also have this uh, extra bias feature that uh, um, is always going to take the value one. And uh, the cartoon example, what it says is the, the way to uh, interpret this picture is this feature travels down this wire x1 goes down that wire and when it does so it gets multiplied by this number w1 so at this element here there's a summation you get w1 x1 plus w2 x2 plus w3 x3 w4 x4 but there's also this bias term that this is a constant that travels down this wire and gets multiplied with a one so there's also a b and that's your dot product because this is really if you uh, b plus w transpose x and then once you have this you apply you threshold it um, if this is greater than zero then you say the label is plus one otherwise you say the label is minus one so in some sense uh, this is just a, a cartoon a, a picture for what a linear threshold unit does um, to information that comes into it. So there is a dot product followed by a threshold. The threshold is a function that uh, looks like, you know, uh, if at zero here, this is zero, this is uh, positive, and here this is B plus W transpose X. And when the input is, the input is uh, greater than zero, then you get a plus one, Otherwise, you get a minus one. So effectively, you can think of a linear threshold unit as something that takes an input feature vector, applies a dot product with some weights, um, uh, and then applies some sort of a transformation to it. In particular, a linear threshold, uh, sorry, a threshold unit. That's why you have a linear threshold unit because this part is linear and this thing here is threshold. So, um, there's nothing, uh, th th this is nothing new. It's just a different way of looking at the same information. Uh, so what you've seen before, this is, uh, this is perceptron. This is uh, logistic regression. This is SVM. All linear classifiers basically behave this way. Once training is done, because really uh, you take a sign of a weight, uh, a dot product of weights and features plus some bias. And uh, that's your prediction. Now, 
given this class of functions, this is a hypothesis class. Given this hypothesis class, we have looked at various algorithms for uh, uh, learning. So we've looked at perceptron, we've looked at SVM, we've looked at logistic regression, you've implemented perceptron, you will be implementing SVM, hopefully you've already done it. It's a tiny change from perceptron and you uh, hopefully you're going to implement logistic regression, hopefully you've already done that or at least thought about how you're going to do it. In general, all these algorithms involve minimizing loss. There are other kinds of losses that you can minimize and you get other uh, classifiers that uh, other learning algorithms that don't have such nice names. They're just minimizing some loss. A question that's completely unresolved is about uh, these features. Where do these features come from? Now, in everything that we've seen so far, the features come from uh, someone thinking hard about the problem. Uh, they just involve, uh, you know, uh, domain expertise, let's say, or uh, someone looking at the task and giving you features, or in the case of your project, someone just giving you the features and uh, you don't have to, you don't get to control what they are. So the question that we might think about is features. Let's think about each element of this feature vector. So X1 through X4. X1 is a feature. It's an attribute of the input problem. In decision trees, we saw that this can, there's a very uh, easy interpretation. These are like attributes, like, you know, is the weather sunny today, for example. Now, the, the question is, how did, who invented this feature? How do, how do you know what, uh, what features to look for? The more, uh, the, the intriguing proposition that neural networks opens up is, what if these features with themselves, the outputs of another classifier? So instead of the features, the, 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 there are some raw inputs. This is like raw sensor data if you want. Um, uh, it's like, you know, imagine that you're, you, you're trying to build a self-driving car. Raw sensor data would involve things like uh, LIDAR measurements and, uh, you know, maybe weather conditions and road conditions and all those things. And uh, I, I would like to convert those raw measurements into features and what if those raw measurements were fed into a classifier that produced features for you. So effectively what we are doing is we are taking this sort of a, a picture that we had, had where some inputs were directly given into uh, the final decision uh, problem and separating the inputs from the final decision and saying each of these things here, uh, the, 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 uh, each feature to the final decision itself comes from another classifier, another, uh, another uh, uh, learned system. It could be a classifier, it could be a regressor, it could be anything. Another learned system takes raw sensor readings. This time the X's are not features, but raw uh, readings. Sends them into some learned system and uh, produces a feature that goes down this wire here for uh, uh, for the final decision that's going to happen here. This can happen uh, for every single feature. You can essentially build up um, uh, this sort of a threshold, uh, this sort of a layered architecture. What I have shown here is a two-layer feed-forward neural network. So let's uh, see why it's a two-layer. There are uh, There is the input and the hidden layer. Uh, so the this the, the inputs just the raw sensor readings there is one hidden layer which uh, takes the raw sensor readings and produces uh, multiple features and then there is the output layer which uh, takes all these features and produces a decision so uh, it's called two layers because there are two learned layers here and it's a feed forward network because there are uh, all the arrows point in uh, there are no loops you can't go from this node uh, back into something like this. Um, so it, the information feed uh, moves only in one direction. So you can think of, so the, the, the intuitive way to think about a neural network or this particular network here is this hidden uh, layer here is learning a good representation for the inputs that are here, uh, a good representation for whatever task is needed at this level. So there is a task um, that, uh, when the 
task here is, is defined by uh, your the problem you care about maybe it's a spam detector for example your raw inputs could be just the words in the email or it could be the raw html or it could be ascii code or it could be just the bit stream that corresponds to the email make it as uh, low level as you want and then you leave all the work of feature extraction to this hidden layer and uh, it takes all the raw data and computes as many features the the fact that there are four things here and four things here is accidental you can take four things here and convert it into 400 here um, and uh, this is essentially you're creating a hidden representation uh, it's hidden because it's not uh, it's not the input it's not the output and it's it, it, you're creating a learned representation of the input and you're create you're hoping that the learned representation is the best representation for the task you have so uh, just a, a, a matter of notation this dot product here uh, plus some uh, threshold so far we've only seen threshold together um, constitutes an artificial neuron uh, there are five neurons here in this picture there is this thing here and then there is each of these so uh, uh, so there are four uh, in the hidden layer four so essentially the uh, the the notation or the terminology that is often used is the width of the layer the width of the hidden layer is four and then the output layer has uh, just one one layer one bit um but then um ah, okay so there are questions what happens to the neural network if there are loops that gives us grief uh if there are loops then uh, it causes problems with using back propagation the back propagation algorithm kind of uh, uh, gets uh, doesn't work essentially uh, so we we need to uh, make sure that we don't have loops. There, there in uh, the 70s and 80s, there was a lot of uh, interesting proposals on bringing in uh, not just feed forward but multi-direction um, uh, communication in across this network. Uh, but pretty much most of the stuff we see today involves uh, uh, no cycles. Um, so there's another question is this technique similar to part three of homework six where we have svm over trees in actually that's a very good observation so um this is a uh, the, the, the svm over trees is reminiscent of this technique simply because we have some learned features and we are building a linear classifier on top the key difference between that technique uh, the, the that particular uh, homework question and what we have with neural networks we will see is remember that there are weights associated with this layer here and there are weights on all these edges in a neural network typically not always but typically um, we will train all these weights and all these weights together in with just one shot what that means is we want to find the best representation and the best classifier jointly through just this one training objective. In the homework, you train, you find the trees separately and uh, that's fixed and then you move on to the SVM. The SVM does not get the loss for the SVM in particular, the loss for SVM doesn't get to control what features it chooses. Um, is this like an ensemble of perceptrons? It's almost like an ensemble of perceptrons. It's a, uh, at this level, yes. I mean, the picture that's shown here, you can think of it as an ensemble of perceptrons that are all weighted by uh, this higher level thing, um, except there's a tiny bit of a, a detail that is missing. Namely, we don't have any supervision for these intermediate layers. The only supervision that we get is from here about the task. So we don't get any supervision that says, Feature number one or um, hidden layer unit number one takes the value plus or minus one. We don't, uh, the, the, the learner cannot do that. But there's a, the, the next question that uh, from Hunter is actually very interesting. How do you ensure that each feature does not learn the same thing? This is, uh, uh, this is uh, important. Um, so if you are not careful, yes, that's exactly what will happen. Every feature will end up learning the same thing because they are essentially indistinguishable from each other. Uh, to ensure that the hidden uh, layer weights, essentially, the, the features are defined by the weights in this uh, hidden layer, right? 
the hidden layer weights actually give you different features. What you do is you initialize the network with a random uh, with random weights, and you let the randomness make sure that uh, ensure that uh, everything is not identical. And this is sufficient. Let's uh, uh, this, let's look at a few, a few more examples and uh, a, a slight formalization of this, and we'll come back to this question uh, when we talk about learning. So. A question that usually comes to mind right now is I have just made the problem a little, uh, you know, I, I, I said, so let's think about how I set the problem up. I said, um, I'm, I want features from the classifiers. And then I said, uh, yeah, we'll have this hidden layer that learns the best feature for the classifier. But at the input layer, somebody still has to decide what are good features. Where do those features come from? What are the input layers where themselves output of outputs of another classifier? What that means is this whole thing gets, uh, or actually uh, this whole thing here gets separated from the raw input because you take, uh, you, you feed the raw input to another classifier or another set of uh, uh, classifiers and they produce the input that goes into this layer and uh, this layer produces the input that goes into the output layer and so on. So essentially we would have introduced one more layer here. That would give you a three layer network. So you can keep going. Uh, essentially this is a design choice. You can, uh, uh, you can keep making the network deeper and deeper and that's why you're call they are called deep neural networks. So it's the depth of the, this particular thing. Now, uh, uh, is there a limit on this depth? Um, in theory, no. Um, in practice, we are restricted by a few uh, pr practical considerations. The first one, of course, is your, what your hardware can support. The second is uh, we will see that uh, when this thing gets really, really deep, uh, what you will end up with is uh, extreme overfitting. Um, so uh, that as the models get deeper and deeper, we have to work harder to avoid overfitting. Uh, but Today we are, um, the, the current state of the art involves uh, dozens, if not hundreds of layers, and uh, there are rather robust methods for avoiding overfitting that we'll discuss a few of. Um, is the input layer a layer of neurons? Uh, it depends on the convention. Um, may, the one that I'm following and the one that seems to be common is you don't consider the input layer to be a layer. So the layer is defined uh, by anything that has parameters. So this layer has parameters and this layer has parameters. So we have two layers. If you introduce one more parameterized layer, that becomes three layers. Okay, um, this is just a cartoon example. Um, oh, what is on the picture is a two layer network. If we introduce one more layer here, then it becomes a three layer network. Um, so uh, this is, all of this is just a cartoon example. Uh, let's make this a little bit more formal. So uh, neural networks are a robust method for uh, uh, approximating functions of all kinds. Essentially what they are, are function approximators. They can approximate real valued functions, discrete valued functions, vector valued functions, and uh, essentially they, uh, can, they are uh, extremely, an extremely expressive representation for functions in general. Uh, they are among the most effective supervised uh, learning methods that are currently known. Um, and uh, they seem to be especially good when your data is uh, hard to interpret, like, you know, photographs and images uh, and, uh, you know, text and uh, audio and such things, uh, speech signals and essentially things that involve real world sensors. Um, because uh, in such data, it's very hard to invent features. Um, by just staring at the problem, whereas these uh, networks can actually learn the features. One of the reasons for the successes of neural networks is the fact that uh, the backpropagation algorithm exists. The backpropagation algorithm is uh, essentially a, a way to compute gradients and uh, it drives pretty much all of uh, um, neural network learning today. And uh, we've seen successes in a wider variety of domains. Uh, to start off this discussion on neural networks, I'll probably have to start with uh, biological neurons 
um, these are uh, you know comp components in the brain um, this is a picture uh, or this is a drawing by the first person who actually identified uh, brain cells as a separate thing uh, santiago ramon ecayal and uh, uh, these are uh, you know essentially cells that collect information from other such cells and then uh, process them to uh, integrate them somehow and generate output spikes that uh, forwards information biological neurons constitute uh, the brains of uh, say uh, pretty much all the all the mammals that we know this is pretty much all i'm going to say about biological neurons modern Artificial neurons are inspired by biological neurons, but they are so different. They are so different. So I would not, uh, I don't know anything more about uh, biological neurons. Um, be fun to sound, looks like it's a, a fun thing to learn, but uh, there are so many fundamental differences that I'm good. This is pretty much all I'll have to say about biological neurons. Anytime I say neuron from now on is an artificial neuron, which we'll define in a minute. Don't take the similarity between these things uh, see, uh, seriously. It's almost uh, misleading um, when you hear uh, um, neural networks and then people say, oh, this uh, is working the same way the human brain works. We don't know how the human brain works. And uh, even the little we know has very little to do with uh, how modern uh, artificial neural networks learn. So uh, this is just uh, advice about taking things in the um, in the technology sections of newspapers a little too seriously because, uh, because uh, they tend to over hype uh, things. So let's uh, move quickly past biological neurons um, to artificial neurons. Artificial neurons are formally functions. They are mathematical functions that very, very, very loosely mimic a biological neuron. Uh, this function accepts a collection of inputs uh, most often in the form of a vector and produces an output. The way it produces an output is it takes the dot product of that vector with some weights, adds the bias, and then transforms this dot product, this sum, this number. At the end of step one, we get a number. And then it transforms this number with something called an activation. And it produces an output. So the output is an activation function applied to this linear transformation. Um, so we've already seen one example of this. There's a dot product followed by what's called a threshold activation. In your homework, in the extra credit question, I'm asking you to think about this uh, threshold activation. So th and, uh, the threshold activation is actually a rather inconvenient thing to see or use, as we will see. Um, there are other activations that exist. There are other uh, transformations that you could do to this particular uh, uh, number and you get different kinds of neurons. Um, so if you take the input, so if you, this is the, all, everything in the table here uh, is talking about this particular function. If you take the input and uh, the activation of Z is the, uh, this is Z itself, namely it takes the input and sends it out. That particular neuron is called a linear neuron. There is no thresholding. It's just literally a linear transformation. So this essentially will produce uh, w transpose x plus b the another thing that we've already seen is the threshold unit the threshold or the sign uh, uh, unit which takes the input w transpose x plus b and produces the sign of that number we've also seen the sigmoid unit the sigmoid unit is uh, the 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 thing that the transformation that's applied at the top of uh, the logistic regression classifier, this takes uh, the input and just converts it into the sigmoid of W transpose X plus B. Um, there are other activations that many, many other activations that exist. Uh, two that tend to show up a lot is the, uh, are the rectified linear unit and the tan H unit. The rectified linear unit takes an input and compares it with zero. If the input is positive, then it just sends it on. Otherwise, it just sends the zero. So it, uh, it's max of zero comma. So this will produce max of zero comma W transpose X plus B. 
And the other one that, uh, that shows up quite often in the literature is the tan H unit. It takes the input and applies, it takes the W transpose X plus B and applies the tan H function to it. And each activation has interesting properties and uh, there are many, many more activation functions. What's uh, shown in the table is typically the most commonly used ones. Uh, there is also uh, something, um, there's also the softmax, which we will talk about later. Um, there are many other activations that exist that are uh, less common. For example, you could have a sinusoid activation. You can take uh, uh, the W transpose X plus B and pass it through, say, the cosine function or the sink function or the Gaussian uh, or a polynomial. There are other activations that exist, but they are relatively less common. But the thing is, all of these essentially are of the same type. Um, they uh, you can kind of, as a cartoon, think of it in the same way. An input X comes in, it gets multiplied with some parameters, that's your dot product, and a different activation happens here. Um, so uh, there is a question, which activation function is most similar to the one that biological networks use? None of them. Uh, biological networks, to the best of our knowledge, involve, uh, don't do any of these things. Uh, they involve something called uh, uh, spike train network. They essentially send out single signals rather than, it's a more complicated thing. Um, uh, the, our artificial neurons don't really mimic biological neurons that well. Uh, so I strongly encourage you not to think of that connection when we're talking about artificial neurons. It's much more productive to think of them as just functions. Each of this is a function that takes some input and produces an output by taking a dot product with some weights and applying some confirmation. That's all there is. Now, this is the, the, the artificial neuron is the fundamental uh, building block of um, the, the new, uh, neural network. Oh, why would we pick one activation function over the other? There, so, so this is an interesting question. Um, at some level, uh, it, it, they are, it's a design choice. It's often, um, well, the short answer is you try hard, you, 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 play, you evaluate different activation functions and pick the one that works the best for your data. Actually speaking more, uh, the longer version involves every activation function has interesting properties and you might want to actually take advantage of some of those properties that it offers. For example, the ReLU, uh, rectified linear unit, uh, only gives positive numbers. Maybe you want that, or maybe you want a probability. And so you want, uh, or you want something that looks like a probability. So, uh, or maybe you, your problem is a regression problem. And so your output can be any real number. So you want a linear unit, or maybe you're, uh, uh, you know, the, you, or maybe you're uh, okay with numbers between minus one to one. And that's why you want a tan edge. So uh, it's, a, there's no uh, clean answer there. Anyway, but these things are the building blocks for uh, a neural network. A neural network is, abstractly speaking, a function that converts inputs into outputs and is defined as a directed acyclic graph. The nodes in this graph are the neurons. Um, they are typically organized as layers. And the edges carry the output of one neuron to another or one layer to another and every edge is associated with weights. So you might get some pictures uh, like this. Um, the graph is definitely assumed to be connected. Um, so you have uh, uh, so you have some inputs here. These are all the nodes in the graph. All the edges assume are directed in this way. And uh, uh, there are in this picture, there are five nodes here, three nodes here and two nodes here. And uh, every node corresponds to a neuron. The edges bring in input into that. And the nodes are associated with a weight uh, uh, weight vector, and it, or if you want to think of the entire layer of nodes as one block, then this entire layer is associated with a weight matrix because you have one vector here, one vector here, and one here. And in this case, you have one here and one here. Um, and uh, the, together, these edges carry uh, information from nodes, uh, uh, you know, from one node to another. In order to define this neural network, we need to specify one, what's the structure of this graph? How many nodes there are, how they are arranged uh, in layers, if they are, and uh, how they are connected. Um, 
and this is uh, and uh, this is the, the the design of a neural network is or uh, it it uh, is it's a rather difficult task i mean uh, there are named neural network designs that if you don't care about how they work you can just use them uh, as black boxes or if you care about how they work you can look into them but coming up with a new design for a neural network is actually pretty tricky um but in, ad in addition to the structure of the graph, we also need to specify what's happening inside each node. Remember, every node is essentially uh, of the same type. It's, uh, it takes some uh, input, uh, applies uh, W transpose, you know, dot product, adds a bias, and, uh, and uh, um, processes it with some sort of a activation function. So we need to choose what is the activation function in each node. So in order to specify this graph, we need to specify what's the structure of the graph, what is the type of each node. Um, and finally, we also need to uh, identify what are the edge weights. There are three big high level decisions that need to be made when in, or in order for us to make a prediction with a neural network. We need to know the structure, we need to know uh, the, uh, the activations and we need to know the edge weights. Typically, the structure of the graph and the activation function on each node together is called the architecture. The architecture of the network is often predefined. Uh, you get named architectures like, say, uh, convolutional neural networks or uh, uh, recurrent neural networks or transformers and such things. And the only thing that's really learned, usually, uh, are the edge weights. So when we talk about neural network learning, the most common, nearly almost all effort is spent, uh, or uh, all uh, intellectual effort in the context of neural network learning has been um, focused on learning the weights on the edge edges from data. So this is what we'll talk about. This is what uh, we will uh, see how we can learn this thing. And essentially uh, learning uh, the, so neural network learning is actually kind of easy given everything that we have seen so far because uh, we've just uh, it'll, it just involves um, uh, we, we will see loss minimization. So there's a good question. Uh, what's the significance of this graph being acyclic? It turns out the fact that the graph is acyclic is crucial because um, it's because of the fact that it's directed and acyclic, uh, we can apply the backpropagation algorithm. The backpropagation algorithm crucially relies on the fact that the graph is acyclic. If there are cycles in the graph, backpropagation is not going to work. And backpropagation is what we are going to use uh, inside the inner loop when we are uh, doing the learning. Are there any other questions? Uh, it's good that uh, there are questions that keep coming along. Uh, uh, are there any more? What does acyclic mean? It just means that there are no cycles. So you can't have a node that sends information here, that sends somewhere here, and then this goes back here. You can't have loops. Or even this, for example. That's also, this, is, this has a cycle. So what we have seen here is just um, you know, uh, an abstract definition for a class of functions that takes some input and in a procedural way, it uh, produces some outputs. Um, uh, yeah, so yes, uh, so let me, uh, uh, the, the, there is a, a slight confusion in the picture. All edges here have a direction. That's what this arrow is representing. Every edge uh, has an is directed going up this way. Uh, I didn't want to draw the edges on all these uh, thing, uh, the arrows on every single edge because it just makes the graph uglier than it is. But all edges here are directed. Um, this seems similar to principal component analysis. Uh, can you comment on the similarities? Oh, that's a very interesting observation. It is actually there's a certain version of it that has uh, uh, similarities to PCA. Uh, where the hidden layer can be seen as a, um, like a low dimensional representation of the input uh, data. 
uh, this in particular works if all the features, all the nodes in both, uh, in, in particular in the hidden layer are uh, linear, namely they just use uh, the linear activation, uh, this thing here. In that case, uh, you get something that's very much like PCA. It's, you get dimensionality reduction basically. So let's uh, uh, go ahead. Um, what we have seen so far is just a, 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 represent, a, you know, a description of what neural networks are. They're directed acyclic graphs that represent functions, but not any directed acyclic graphs. They are directed acyclic graphs where the nodes are neurons that we just defined and the edges are weighted. And uh, you know, the, the, if, you, if you don't want to think too hard about it, all we have is a procedural way that uh, for defining some sort of an operation that takes some input and uh, passes information through the edges to produce some output. So it's just a function. It takes some input and produces some output. And there can be many, many hidden layers if necessary. This uh, line of uh, thinking is actually not new. Neural networks have, uh, uh, are uh, you know, popular now, but uh, they've been popular on and off all the time. Uh, perhaps the first uh, uh, real uh, computational effort in terms of neural networks was uh, from this landmark work of Makolo and Pitts when they showed that uh, linear threshold units can compute logical functions. Effectively, uh, this is something that you've been doing, uh, say, for homework too. Um, and then, but this was, at that point, there was not, still, this was just about expressive. There was not, nothing about learning. Um, another uh, very famous work uh, from 1940s again, uh, 1949, was from Hebb, who suggested uh, a learning rule called Hebbian learning uh, that had some sort of a physiological plausibility. The big leap that happened uh, with neural networks was in 1950s with uh, Rosenblatt. Uh, the perceptron algorithm was uh, actually efficient learning algorithm for a single threshold uh, neuron. Uh, the, the, the perceptron linear threshold unit or linear classifier is simply a neural network that's just a single layer uh, thing. And then in the 1960s, uh, there was a lot of excitement about perceptrons um, and Minsky and Papert studied the perceptron from a geometrical perspective and they pointed out, you know, this uh, is a single, a single layer is not enough because uh, you can't even do things like uh, the XOR function. And that really kind of killed uh, interest in neural networks for a while, um, but it didn't mean, it, it didn't extinguish it. Uh, there was also, there was a lot of uh, work happening in the 70s and 80s. Um, uh, Fukushima um, uh, who, and subsequently Jan LeCun worked on what are called convolutional neural networks, taking inspiration from uh, mammalian uh, visual cortices and uh, Multiple people, multiple uh, research groups over the decades, all the going all the way back to the 50s or 60s, uh, kept reinventing this algorithm that today we call the backpropagation algorithm. Um, and the problem was at that time there was uh, uh, both the all these things, uh, backpropagation and multi-layer perceptrons, um, convolutional models, were limited by the fact that we don't have tons of data and we don't have a lot of uh, uh, compute and compute is expensive. Since uh, the 2000s, uh, two big things happened. First of all, uh, uh, hardware become, becomes uh, became cheap and we could actually run massive experiments. And in order to run those massive experiments, um, a lot of data became available. It became easier, a lot easier to collect a lot of data uh, thanks to the internet and just better uh, connectivity. And this has led to this explosion that uh, we uh, call deep net, that we call deep learning today. Um, it uses ideas that have uh, that trace all the the way back all the way back to 50s and 60s, um, and uh, we are essentially uh, bearing the fruits of the really hard effort done by these groups of people. The reason I'm uh, uh, talking about this history is uh, just as a uh, you know, I know that many of you here are grad students, many of you are doing PhDs and all those things. And uh, um, 
it's amazing the kind of resilience and the kind of uh, perseverance shown by these people like Lacan and Hinton and others who worked on a, in a field in the 1980s that everyone was convinced was basically not uh, not a viable thing and they stuck to that uh, that uh, that line of work and uh, it paid off so there's something to about perseverance and research and uh, it's a nice story there but stories aside let's come back to neural networks um, we should think about what kinds of uh, the, the, what we have here is just a collection of uh, a, a way to define a function and we can always ask what kinds of functions do neural nets, networks express? If you have a single neuron with a threshold activation, we've seen this before, a single layer neural network with threshold is just a, a linear classifier. It can, it, you know, it can separate out things like this. If you have uh, two layers, again, with threshold activations, you can represent things like convex polygons. And uh, because effectively, effectively every line here is a threshold and uh, this is a big hint for uh, your homework uh, extra credit or one of the extra credit questions if you have three layers with threshold activations you can represent unions of convex polygons so everything inside all the shaded parts are uh, positive and everything else is not and you can uh, do this you can do more complicated things also um, uh, with um, uh, with as the deep as the depth gets uh, more, um, but in general, the important thing to uh, keep in mind is neural networks are universal function approximators. Uh, there is a classic theorem from Sybenko from 1989 that says that any continuous function, any arbitrary continuous function, can be approximated to arbitrary accuracy using just one hidden layer with sigmoid units. This is a remarkable representation theorem. Uh, it essentially uh, points out that uh, one layer of unit, one, uh, two, one, if you have one hidden layer, that's just a two layer network. A two layer neural network with sigmoid in the middle and a, a linear uh, unit at the top can represent any function. Now this is amazing because uh, uh, it seems like we, that's it. We don't need any more. We just need two layer networks and we are good to go. There is, in, unfortunately, uh, this theorem hides a, uh, effectively an infinity inside the hidden layer. It doesn't tell you how many units are needed uh, in the hidden layer. It, 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 to get to arbitrary accuracy, you would need an arbitrarily large number of hidden units. It's a very intriguing construction. Uh, it, uh, it's worth thinking about how to make that work. Um, there's another uh, result from Das Gupta and others from uh, 93, which says that this approximation error from Saibenko is actually not even sensitive to the choice of activation functions. It's, it doesn't have to be sigmoid. Sigmoids are easier to prove, but uh, it actually works in general. Um, oh, there's a question. Uh, I'm not sure I see the pattern as the number of layers goes up. Uh, you can get unions of intersections and you can, um, uh, this is uh, don't take this too uh, seriously because it's a uh, what you get is um, as the number of layers goes up, what you really get is better, more compact representations for functions. Uh, each layer becomes simpler, and it becomes it, it has to do with learning rather than I, I I'm I would argue that you know three layers are enough, but then that also that argument also implicitly hides an infinity just like Saibenko's because it talks about the width. If I'm willing to make the network really, really wide, then we don't need uh, um, arbitrary depth. Two or three should be good. But given that the depth is, uh, the width is limited, uh, things are more interesting. The, the, there's a, the distinct, the, the, this is an open, the, this is an open area of research. What is the impact of making it arbitrarily deep or arbitrarily wide? Arbitrarily wide was kind of uh, uh, almost resolved by this work, but arbitrarily deep, we still have uh, uh, some uh, way to go before we understand the details. One thing that we know is uh, actually one thing that's easy to prove is a two layer threshold network can represent any Boolean function. If your inputs are Boolean and your outputs are Boolean, 
All you need is a two layer threshold network, possibly arbitrarily wide or exponentially actually wide, but you can represent any Boolean function. And this is something that you should try to prove. Uh, the way to think about it is convert your Boolean function into a uh, CNF, conjunctive normal form, or a DNF, a disjunctive normal form, and think what, what uh, uh, you can do with that. Um, we also, uh, what do I mean by wide? Wide is just the number of neurons in a single layer. So um, in this picture here, the width of this layer is three, the width of this layer is five, the width of this layer is two. And the depth of this network is two or three, depending on how you count. So width is just a number of uh, nodes in each layer. So th there's another uh, set of results also from the 90s, which talks about the VC dimension. If you have E edges um, in a threshold, network, then the VC dimension is roughly uh, E log E, the number of edges log the number of edges. Or if, they are, if, the, if the edges are all denoted by E, then it's the number of edges log the number of edges. If you have uh, V nodes and E edges with a sigmoid network, then essentially the result is uh, you have a, a bound of uh, the VC dimension is between, is essentially E squared, the number of edges squared. So as the number of edges goes up, the VC dimension goes up and uh, what we understand from learning theory is if the VC dimension goes up, learning becomes harder. Uh, learning could become harder or more concretely, as the VC dimension goes up, the gen overfitting becomes more problematic and this is definitely true. With neural networks, we can actually end up overfitting quite a bit. However, as we will see, empirical results suggest otherwise. VC dimension only says, um, all the learning theory results that we, uh, we saw, says um, that you have, if you have these many examples, if the number of examples is more than some function of the VC dimension, then the generalization error will be low. However, it does not say what happens when the number of examples is less than that. It does not say learning is not possible, it just says, to have this guarantee, if you have these many examples, you have the guarantee. So it seems like we are missing some lower bounds with learning, and this is an open theoretical question. Um, we don't really have a good grasp of lower bounds when it comes to learning. And uh, neural networks, the fact that they work, they work so well, suggests that uh, maybe the lower bounds are reasonable. They're not uh, uh, always bad. So is the a question, is this result for a two-layer network? No, it's true for any uh, network. It's true, it, it, there's nothing here about the number of layers. It's just about the number of edges. Okay, um, one, uh, uh, a few exercise questions. Uh, first one, I asked you to think about how to prove that uh, a, a two-layer threshold network can express any Boolean function. Another one is to uh, uh, show that if you have only linear units, meaning all your activations are just the identity function, then adding more layers does not change the expressiveness of your system. Think about how to do that uh, and think about why that might be the case. So I'm not going to talk about that right now. All right, so given all this, um, let's go back to, um, uh, let's uh, move ahead. There are 15 minutes left and I'm going to try to, um, actually finish this uh, thing. What we have seen so far is uh, we've seen what neural networks are. Um, it's just a way to define a function. It's just a way in which we can define a function and it's a rather rich uh, class of functions because any function can, uh, can be, exp you know, there, there are, uh, um, any function can be approximated uh, pretty well using this rather broad class of functions. Once we have this class of functions, we should also ask, how do you make a prediction? Let's pretend that we have a neural network. Uh, we have, by that I mean, we have the architecture of the network, we have this layout of the graph, we have all the activations, and importantly, we have all the weights of all the edges. And we are presented with one input. How do we make a prediction? 
to illustrate this, I'm going to use this example neural network. Um, and you, I'm uh, rather than talking about the general principle, I'm going to uh, use this example to show how prediction works because it's actually rather simple. So here we have a two layer network. Um, and uh, the width of this layer, each, you know, this width is two here and this width is also two. Um, as a naming convention, I'm going to stick to this convention uh, for uh, the, the rest of this lecture, not today and also when we look at back propagation. Um, the inputs, um, or maybe I change it, okay, I'll figure it out. So the inputs are X, the outputs Y, and I'm just going to call the hidden uh, units uh, z. So you have x1, x2. So this is written as a vector x is x1, x2. This is z is z1, z2, and the output is y. But this is not sufficient. I mean, just naming the units is not going to give us anything. We, oh, by the way, notice that I also always, I have a bias feature that's always one. So this is the, we need the bias feature, otherwise things are not going to work. Um, it's not enough to just say that we have these units. We need to, in order to specify what the neural network actually does, I need to say what are the activations for each of these nodes in the uh, hidden and the output layer. So at the hidden layer, assume that both the Zs are associated with the sigmoid activation function. Just to remind you, the sigmoid activation function is the one that's used in logistic regression. It's one over one plus E power minus Z. And then there is also, we need to specify the output activation function. Assume that the output activation is just linear. By linear, that means the output node takes the input, uh, the output node takes whatever is given to it, computes the dot product with the parameters that are associated with, associated with the edges, performs no transformation to it, and just sends out the output. So the output can be any real number. Effectively, what we have here is a network that can take, I mean, I've said nothing about inputs. Let's say that the inputs are any real numbers. So what we have here is an, a function that can take two real numbers, x1 and x2, pass them through the network and produce a real number. So we, this the kind of a network could be used, for example, for a regression problem. The way it computes the net thing is, uh, well, that's what we're gonna talk about in a minute. Um, but in order to kind of, get into the gory details of how the um, network actually computes things, we need some sort of convention for uh, uh, identifying every uh, edge here. And the convention I have used is every W is uh, the subscript is the, uh, the node, the, uh, it's from this node to this node in the target layer. So uh, W01 out is from neuron number zero, which is this thing here, to the first neuron, the only neuron in the um, output layer, and uh, uh, the output is specified here. It's just a convention, this is just so that uh, we have, we need to be able to identify these edges. Okay, um, are there any questions before we um, talk about how the prediction works? This is just like, I, what I have done here is I have set up the architecture of the network. Namely, I've told you what the uh, directed acyclic graph is. And I've also set up, uh, I've also told you what all the activation functions are. Just to remind you, you have a sigmoid here, a sigmoid here, and a linear. Linear is just a name for um, the identity function. It takes the input and just uh, dot products uh, with the weights and sends it out. What dictates the number of edges um, that uh, uh, at each layer? The number of edges at each layer. This is uh, it, it, the, the, what. So I'm assuming this these edges, right? It two things really dictated. The first one is uh, what is the width of the input layer, and what's the width of the, the sorry. What's the so you can think of if you think in terms of layers. So let's think layers here. This is layer. Um, one, this is this is layer i plus one, and this is layer i. And there are many, many edges. The thing that dictates it is uh, you have, let's say, n nodes here, and you have m nodes here. Uh, let's say you have a bias term also. The number of edges is really 
n plus one times m because you have uh, one for every node here you have you're connecting to all n plus one plus one because of the bias and uh, you do that m times so it's really you can think of actually the uh, and this is how it's usually done all the edges are together all the weights on the edges are together thought of as a matrix because you have connectivity going from uh, every node to every node so what determines the number of edges it's the width of the layer that determines the number of edges um, you assume that the graph is fully connected and hope that learning figures out that if the connection is not uh, full, uh, uh, it's, if it's not fully connected, this particular edge maybe has a zero weight. Uh, but this is not always true. Here's an, this is just an assumption that I'm making. This is true for multi-layer perceptrons. Um, it does not hold, for example, for uh, uh, other certain classes of uh, neural networks where the graph is not fully connected. Uh, uh, one um, famous example of that is, uh, say, the convolutional neural network, which uh, introduces a very interesting kind of connectivity. So, uh, but for multi-layer perceptrons, we assume that the graph is fully connected and hope that the learning, however we do it, if the connection should not exist, the learning will figure out that that weight should have, a, that edge should have a zero weight. Um, so there are a few questions that I missed. Let's see. Do you need to keep a bias term for each layer? Yes. Um, think about, uh, it, it just improves expressiveness. So think about what the bias does for, uh, uh, for uh, a linear classifier and uh, effectively what we're saying is we don't want classifiers, uh, you know, we, we don't, at each layer, we don't want models that only, uh, um, you know, the, we don't want the limited express, expressiveness. So the bias improves expressiveness without adding too much complexity. So you always keep a bias. Uh, why organize the network uh, into layers? We can connect the uh, neurons arbitrarily as long as it's acyclic. Absolutely, yes. Uh, this is the simplest one, and there are so many may more uh, connectivity uh, patterns out there. For example, there are some day, some uh, cool ideas that involve having, you know, two ways to go from one node to another, and things like that. So this is just the simplest version. Okay, so we have this uh, this sort of a representation of a function. What we need to know do next is how do we make predictions of this. Um, ah, so the learning is trying to identify functions that take x and produce the y actually. Um, we don't get any supervision typically, not always, but almost always, we hardly get supervision at this layer. So learning is trying to find all these weights. It given inputs that look like x, y pairs, find the set of weights that uh, best approximates the function that produced the y from the x. Just as we've seen so far, it's essentially the same game. The hidden units are um, just anonymous units that don't, uh, um, that we don't get to uh, supervise directly most of the time. But first, let's look at prediction. The way prediction works is uh, our goal is we are given some input x uh, and we need to know the value of y. The convention I'm using here is uh, I'm shading the nodes that we have the values of. So we know x1 and x2. Knowing x1 and x2, what we can do is we can compute the value of z1. z1 operates by applying the sigmoid activation to the dot product of uh, this x and the weight. So you get w01, this edge, plus this times x1 plus this one times x2. The whole thing is just a number and we can take the sigmoid of that and we get the number, uh, the value of Z1. We can apply the same idea for Z2. We can compute the value of Z2 by, uh, you know, this, this edge corresponds to W02H. Uh, this one corresponds to W12H and then you have W22H. So these three things get multiplied with, dot, essentially you have a dot product here. And uh, now we have the values of all the hidden nodes. We always had the value of one because it's one. And now we can compute, we can apply the same process again. We can uh, uh, multiply one with W01 out, uh, Z1 with uh, W11 out, and Z2 with W21 out. And you get a number. This is a linear activation, which means that the output is uh, sent out by this node without any transformation. 
and that gives us the value of the offer. Effectively, uh, the, the, this is the entire game. So what we have here is a way to compute the output uh, value of this thing by going through the entire network. This is called the forward direction. The forward pass involves um, you know, any node whose inputs are fully available, all of these are available, this node can be computed. And you keep doing this, uh, and because we have a connected graph, and because it does not have any cycles, the forward direction is rather straightforward to implement. All you have to do is just go through this, uh, uh, these layers one at a time, and you're done. Um, or go through these nodes if you want to be more uh, concrete. In general, the rule for uh, prediction uh, is uh, visit the, every node in the network one at a time. And in order to visit a node, if you want to visit Z1, we need to ensure that all its inputs are available. And this applies no matter how deep the network is. If you want to visit a node like Y, you can't visit it until its inputs have been visited. So essentially you just go in this uh, bottom up order and this is the forward parts. Are there any questions? And I'll uh, probably stop here and take questions. There are only two minutes left. And uh, are there any questions about the forward pass, about neural networks, about uh, the architecture um, or any of these things? What we have not seen so far is how do we learn? That's going to be what. Uh, that's going to be the whole thing for uh, 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 for Thursday's lecture. There are six layer weights per layer to learn. Um, for the first layer, yes. So there is one, two, three. Every edge corresponds to a weight. So it's six because the easy way to think about it is this is three times two. So there are uh, six weights because the the uh, this layer has uh, the the hidden layer has two elements and the input has three elements so it's uh, just the matrix that corresponds to all pairs so it's w i j all of these things can you number the layers um, meaning can what is layer one um, i don't know let's say that this is layer two this is layer one and this is layer zero I can name the layers. Uh, this is the output layer, as it says there. This is the hidden, and this is the input. So the hidden output layer, those two things are connected by six edges. How wide is beneficial as a rule of thumb? As wide as your hardware can support. Um, and that's not even, uh, I. I I used to say that as a joke, but it almost seems like uh, it's true. I mean, the, even in the last five years, we have grown from, say, uh, using uh, networks with, say, uh, two to 300 units to two to, two, three, two to 3,000 units or 4,000 units. The reason is because uh, we can load all of this into GPUs and do this sort of uh, implement all of this kind of stuff super efficiently on GPU and as GPU memory grows, we can build more layers and train super fast. So um, the thing to keep in mind is as the width gets long, larger or the depth gets larger, you will overfit. So effectively what happens is the width becomes something to do cross validation over or some sort of model fitting. Uh, there are only two layers of neurons. There are only two layers of neurons here. Uh, as neural networks grow, it seems like the computation, oh, we are out of time. So I'm going to, these are the last two questions and then I'll stop. Feel free to drop out if you have other things to do. I'll answer these two though. Um, uh, as neural networks grow, it seems like the computation costs could grow rather large. Do networks use GPUs? Yes, it is super paralyzable. This is why NVIDIA has become a big deal. Um, GPUs are going, uh, the, I mean, all of this is uh, runs on the GPUs. In fact, uh, a recent conversation um, I had with someone uh, it was, going, it was something like this. Okay, I need a CPU for my machine because that's, I need a CPU, but really I need the biggest GPU I can find. The job of the CPU is essentially to orchest orchest orchestrate what information gets sent to the G uh, CPU. That's pretty much it. This is super paralyzable and that's what's done. Uh, is it required for a neuron in um, 
Oh yeah. So just to kind of follow up on that, that's why you also have a lot of specialized hardware for uh, um, uh, machine learning, ASICs, or just custom things. Is it required for a neuron in layer N to take input from every layer in neuron N minus one? No, it's not required. Uh, it's a convention for uh, whenever we see multi-layer perceptrons, this is the convention, but it's not required. There are architectures where this is definitely not true. Um, this is just a cartoon example that we are playing with. Okay, we have to really stop. I mean, we are uh, three minutes past the time, so I don't want to keep you waiting. So uh, on, uh, the, on Thursday's lecture, uh, what we're going to do is look at uh, the back propagation algorithm and see why it's... Uh, uh, you know, why it can be used to implement learning for any neural network of any architecture. All right, let's talk. I'll see you all on Thursday. And uh, of course, I have office hours in about 15 minutes. If you want to continue this conversation and talk about anything else.